What kind of tactics and capabilities will the U.S. Navy's new Columbia-class submarine bring to the table? This is the largest and most complex submarine ever built in U.S. history. If you need any evidence of how important upgrading the U.S. Navy is, look no further than when in August 2023, Russia and China sent a dozen naval ships off the Alaskan coast near the Aleutian Islands. This prompted the U.S. Navy to respond with four U.S. destroyers and likely a stealthy submarine nearby to chase them away. This was the largest flotilla of adversarial ships to come close to American shores. Don't worry, I ain't worried about it at all. The Columbia-class submarine program will play an essential role to intercept these kinds of increasingly aggressive patrols thanks to its twin Mark 48 torpedoes that can fire an estimated 50 kilometers or 31 miles. But more importantly, it's key to what's called strategic deterrence, which is why it has priority status over most other national defense-related projects. When put together, the fleet of Columbia-class submarines will have missiles with long enough range to strike anywhere in the world. Oh neat, I'm anywhere in the world. The US Navy will spend $132 billion to procure 12 Columbia-class nuclear-powered submarines. With that much money, you could instead buy an army of 26,400,000 used Toyota Camrys, something to seriously consider. The ballistic missile submarine is slated to replace the aging Ohio-class subs currently in use by the United States military. Second only to aircraft carriers, nuclear-powered submarines are the most complex craft of the American arsenal. They're a major player in American global military strategy, and how the United States plans to keep its edge against other major world players such as China. But first, I wanna tell you about this video's sponsor, Raycon Earbuds. Personally, I use Raycons all the time. I just had to take a flight to California. It was like five and a half hours long, and I was confident knowing that I'd have enough battery life with Raycons to last the whole flight, and the snug ear fit guarantees they wouldn't fall out during my little plane snooze. You can even pick up a spare set of these and still pay less than some of those other, more big name brands. Besides that, they offer free shipping, free and easy returns, and over 78,000 five-star reviews. And with eight hours of playtime and 32 hours of battery life, you'll have access to quality sound all day long. With three distinct sound profiles, you'll have the range to cover any application. Pure sound for podcasts and audiobooks, bass sound for EDM and hip hop, and balanced sound for pretty much everything else. And school is back in session, so Raycon is having their annual back to school sale. For a limited time only, get 20% off site-wide, plus free shipping. Just go to buyraycon.com slash task and purpose for 20% off site-wide. Brought to you by Raycon. But of course, it wouldn't be a nuclear-capable submarine without nuclear weapons, of which the Columbia class will be able to hold 16 Trident II DLE missiles that'll be upgraded to the D5 LE2s in 2039. This means after the ninth submarine onward, it'll be able to fire the 5D LE2 missile. Each Trident missile, in turn, contains 14 W76-1 thermonuclear warheads. Compare this to the Ohio-class capable missiles, only holding four or five warheads each. Only. Uh, only enough to destroy my city. That said, the Ohio-class had more launch silos at 24, which were reduced to 20 for weapons treaty limitations, but it appears that the new Trident missiles are meant to make up for the reduced silo capacity on the Columbia-class with 16, but what the heck do I know? I joined the army so I could avoid having to even get my feet wet. I could barely swim my way out of a wet paper bag. According to my investigative research, the Earth has a circumference of 24,901 miles. Just walk that one mile and make it a round number. The old Trident 1 missile from 1977 had a max range of 4,600 miles, with accuracy within 500 meters. So the Trident 2, the open source numbers indicate that it has a range of 7,500 miles, although it might be further, it might be less, the exact numbers are top secret, but by placing these submarines at various points around the oceans, you can hit anywhere in the world with redundancy. And nuclear weapons strategy has a lot to do with the R word, redundancy. That said, it's unlikely a Columbia-class submarine would be strictly carrying nuclear warheads outside of World War III, it wouldn't be useful, and the Columbia class is capable of carrying a number of conventional guided cruise missiles such as the BGM-109 Tomahawk in order to take out targets of opportunity from locations no one would be able to expect. Submarines have been used in this way in combat in the past, you might be surprised to learn. During the Gulf War, 
The USS Louisville became the first submarine in history to launch a Tomahawk cruise missile against an enemy target. Then in 2003, the Louisville submarine participated in Operation Iraqi Freedom, launching 16 Tomahawk missiles from the Red Sea against targets in Iraq. Her deployment was extended to eight and a half months in support of the campaign. But what's going to be unique about the Columbia class is that it's network-centric warfare system. That's right, my favorite defense industry buzzword, network-centric warfare. It's called the Submarine Warfare Federated Tactical System, which is a few different systems connected together, so it'll integrate sonar, optical imaging, weapons control, all into one system. Of course, it wouldn't be a submarine without a complement of nice torpedoes, with the Columbia class sporting the new Mark 48 torpedo, which in testing literally split the target vessel in half and sank it in less than 30 seconds. If the Mark 48 torpedo misses, it can actually circle back around for another attempt. It can just call a mulligan and try again. The last time a U.S. submarine fired one of these $1.2 million torpedoes was in 1999 at a leaking oil tanker that had run aground off the coast of Oregon. The Mark 48 has been around since the 1970s, but it's been updated over the decades as recently as 2008, giving it new abilities like the common broadband advanced sonar system allowing it to operate in shallow waters and use advanced sensors to detect and track targets. The Mark 48 ADCAP torpedo uses acoustics homing with sophisticated sonar to hunt its enemies. When we think of the United States military being used in this kind of international political capacity, we typically think of aircraft carrier groups sent to another nation's coastline or troops deployed to potential conflict zones because those are the most visually easy things to key in on. But rarely are submarines mentioned in this, despite the fact that they are a critical linchpin in what's known as America's nuclear triad. In short, the nuclear triad is the nation's way of guaranteeing that it never loses the ability to use its nuclear arsenal. This includes ground-launched land-based nuclear silos, second, long-range stealth bombers like the B-2 or new B-21, and third, submarine-launched nuclear ballistic missiles. When these capabilities are arranged like this, it gives you a triangle, which is my favorite shape of deterrence. Without any one of those options, you wouldn't have a credible, hypothetical retaliation capability. Submarines would survive an enemy's first strike of nuclear weapons against the mainland, the heartland of the United States, and they would be able to retaliate. In game theory, this hypothetically prevents an enemy from ever using weapons in the first place, although I probably have a bit of the tism, even I know people do not operate logically and rationally like game theory robots. Basically, the theory is that the enemy could knock out one of your delivery options with a first strike against you, but likely never all three options at the same time. Although not everyone is a rational actor and the threat is still very real. The US Navy puts it this way, the submarines are operated in a manner that makes their locations unpredictable, while still ensuring that our adversaries know that we have the ability to hold them at risk. This enduring, certain deterrent force acts as an important stabilizer as it's always there and always ready. I found this interesting. So the US Navy's ballistic submarines are often referred to as boomers. So if you wanna show that you're really in the know with your military lingo, go up to a submariner and call him a boomer. I think they'll really appreciate that. Boomers refers to submarines that serve as an undetectable launch platform for intercontinental ballistic missiles that are specifically designed for stealth and precise delivery of nuclear warheads. Warheads that detonate real big and go boom. The nuclear triad has been more on the top of mind recently thanks to China's new stealth bomber, potentially giving them a new ability to secure their nuclear capabilities in tandem with an increasing production of ballistic missile capable subs. There's also the fact that the current Ohio class submarine was really old now and originally designed in 1976 and built in the 1980s. The Columbia class sub can trace its origins to nuclear capabilities review by the DOD in 2010, where it states that strategic nuclear submarines represent the most survivable leg of the US nuclear triad. This is due to the fact that while the locations of land-based nuclear silos is near common public knowledge at this point, and nuclear-capable bombers are still at high risk of interception, nuclear submarines are one of, if not the least detectable asset for our military, because their locations are highly classified, constantly moving, and no one knows about them. The report goes on to say that ensuring a survivable U.S. response force requires a continuous at-sea deployment of SSBNs in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, as well as the ability to surge additional submarines in a crisis. To support this requirement, the United States currently has a 14 nuclear-capable Ohio-class SSBNs. 
The report goes on to state that in order for the United States to keep this nuclear hedge, the Secretary of Defense then directed the Navy to begin technological development for a new submarine, which would eventually culminate into the Columbia-class submarine. This kicked off the Ohio Replacement Submarine, or SSBNX, future follow-on submarine projects, eventually landing on the name Columbia-class program after the District of Columbia as U.S. naval ships are traditionally named after regions of the United States. Personally, I wouldn't mind getting destroyed by something named after Ohio, but it's, it's, it's up to you. You're, maybe you would prefer to be destroyed by something named after Columbia. The development of the Columbia class would last over a decade, with the construction of the first submarine, the USS District of Columbia, not beginning until October 2020, but given the complexity and requirements of designing a nuclear submarine, that's not an unreasonable timeline. As development of the submarine began in earnest in 2013, it remained the Navy's priority development program. This means it took precedence over any and all other development projects, so if you've heard about other ship platforms having problems, it's probably because the Navy's just focusing on this. If budget cuts meant less money for R&D or material shortages, delayed development, extra resources from other projects would be funneled to the Columbia program instead. For example, a Government Accountability Office report found that the shipbuilder added staff to the Columbia-class submarine program who were originally planned for the Virginia-class submarine program, contributing to delays for that program. So other efforts are making sacrifices to lift up the Columbia sub. For the U.S. Department of Defense, this was a no-fail task. Unlike all of those it's-okay-to-fail tasks, what that means is that new F-35s and radar systems are nice, however it's the submarine fleet that ensures a nuclear response is possible at all times. That capability will come at the cost of roughly $8 to $9 billion per vessel. It's interesting to note that the U.S. naval submarines have followed a downward trend in terms of numbers. The ballistic missile submarine force of SSBNs has gone down from 41 total submarines after World War II down to just 14 Ohio-class submarines today, a 65% reduction in force, and the reason the Navy says they were able to do this is thanks to extended range of the D-5 missile and the fact that these submarines are much quieter and harder to detect, although that could just be an excuse to run with less submarines. Now, they are going down to even less now at 12 Columbia-class subs to do the same job. And what is that job? FAS Strategic Security Blog looked into criticisms and support for why 12 is the magic number. It comes down to something called a geography. Rear Admiral Richard Breckenridge defended the decision, saying, There are two important points for you to know about for how strategic deterrence works. The first is that those SSBNs have to be invincible. They have to be survivable at sea. The adversary can't find them, hidden and unable to be detected. Second, they have to be within range of the targets that matter to the adversary, that we can hold that risk to deter or dissuade them from ever considering attacking our homeland. Geography requires that 60-40 split of our SSBN force, he says. A few more in the Pacific than in the Atlantic to be able to meet those two criteria for our nation's defense. Hans Christen, the writer for FAS Strategic Security, wrote in criticism of this saying, 10 of those submarines will be able to carry 160 SLBMs with more than 1,200 warheads, more than Britain, France, China, Pakistan, India, and Israel having their total stockpiles combined. So the argument from him is that this is overkill and we could actually save more money and get away with at eight or less subs. And we could still rest easy at night knowing that we could blow the whole world up seven times over with one single push of the button. The total life cycle cost is estimated to hover around $347 billion. That number is enough to make any government auditor blush, but it's a little deceptive because this submarine program is unique in how incredibly long the deployment and retirement cycle will be. For example, the Ohio-class subs being replaced today are not expected to reach the end of their service fully until 2040, meaning the last Ohio's will have been in continuous service for 59 years, almost six decades. I'd love to see the graffiti in those Ohio-class stalls, everything from down to the Soviet Union mixed with take that terrorists. Captain David Bishop, the Ohio replacement program manager said, quote, the decision made in these early stages of the program will have lasting effects for the next 70 years. This is a kind of scary thought if you're in control of these kind of programs and the directions they go in. I've always thought weapons development requires a bit of looking into the future and predicting what you think the Navy or Army or Air Force will need in 20 to 30 years from now. That's, that's some like wizardry 
next level looking into the future prediction. This is why the military is placing so much focus on making the next generation weapon systems upgradable or modular as they like to say, because new systems need to be able to easily integrate updates and new technology that comes along in the next eight decades. The Columbia class submarine is going to serve as the backbone of the sea-based strategic deterrence until the 2080s, which if science fiction books are correct by then, we'll have well, flying submarines. Ultimately, what this means is that the cost of 347 billion is spread across a 40 year time period. In order to ensure this risk is mitigated, the development of the Columbia class is being done by General Dynamics Electric Boat. They will be responsible for the overall design, engineering, and final assembly of the vessel. And they've subcontracted over 350 separate companies, 5,000 different material suppliers, over 48 different states around the country. All this is compounded by the fact that all design activity is highly classified, greatly reducing the efficiency of the process. Rear Admiral Scott Papano, a head program director for the Columbia, claims the goal of the first deployment in 2031 is aggressive but achievable. Wait, those are the exact same words I was told about my goals by my therapist. At 560 feet long, displacing 20,810 long tons of water when fully submerged, and require General Dynamics to build a new shipyard facility specifically due to its large size. Open source information gives us a decent view into some of its capabilities and allows us to analyze some of the intentions and strategies to be used with this new design. For example, the Navy has published that the sub can reach depths of over 800 feet, but it can likely go much deeper, and the same is true on its on-paper speed of 20 plus knots, which is probably slower than its actual potential speed. One design choice that's a bit more retro than the rest, however, was the use of an electric drive propulsion motor, rather than the mechanical drive systems of previous generations of American submarines. This decision was due to electric drives being both quieter and cheaper to run. Despite them falling out of fashion way back in the 1950s, Northrop Grumman was designated as the designer of Columbia's electric turbines, eventually landing on Leonardo DRS propulsion drive and motor. To further aid in reducing the acoustic signature is the inclusion of an X-form rudder system. The outside of the hull will be covered by something I don't know how to pronounce called the anechoic covering, which is essentially a rubber or synthetic coating on the entire ship filled with thousands of tiny holes with the purpose of absorbing the waves of an active sonar attempting to locate the submarine, distorting and reducing the signature. Within the hull will also be the stern area system, which according to a 2017 congressional report is a technical feature of the stern that is comprised of three subcomponents, details of which are classified, which makes me wonder why they would even bother putting it in there in the first place. The kind of configuration greatly increases the complexity of control schemes for a submarine as all four planes are used for every movement rather than a simple up, down, left, right adjustment to the rudders. However, due to advances in computer technology since the 1980s, all it takes is a simple joystick to move. Hopefully the Navy doesn't cheap out on their joysticks though. This also has the benefit of greatly increasing maneuverability near the surface, which was actually a problem that plagued the Ohio class throughout its lifespan. Of course, it wouldn't be a nuclear submarine without an onboard nuclear reactor to power the ship with the Columbia planning to sport a new design of nuclear electric power rather than a turbine in traditional designs, one major improvement is its reactor is that it, unlike the Ohio class, which required refueling of nuclear material at the midpoint of its life at 20 years, the Columbia class will not have that requirement and have zero refueling during its life. Not saying needing to refuel every 20 years is a bad thing. I wish my car was nuclear powered for that reason. All the open source reporting on this new submarine sounds hopeful there is still a long road ahead before it's expected to set sail in 2031. The success of the Columbia class will entirely be leveraged on its technological edge, an edge that China is currently attempting to curb. Over the last few years, as China has been massively overhauling and upgrading their military across the board, so too have their integration of submarine detection, sonar devices, new anti-submarine guided torpedoes, such as the YU-8 and the KQ-200 maritime patrol aircraft, all of this is an effort to mitigate the overwhelming advantage of the United States submarines. This coincides with China beginning to increase its presence in regional waters with near continuous patrols. This puts the American Navy in a tough spot in terms of timing, the deployment of these new subs, and ensuring that they have the capabilities needed in order to be successful as nuclear deterrent. 
This double requirement meant that the Navy is somewhat gambling on what they call immature technology, essentially technologies that are planned to be integrated that are not out of the prototyping stage just yet. Some examples of this being the defects with the proposed missile tubes and integrated power systems. If prototype technologies hit development setbacks, as they tend to do, the Navy is either forced to delay its production until it's resolved, which could risk placing the US at a strategic disadvantage, or to pay massive sums of cash in order to rush fixing whatever problems arise. And while on the surface the idea of putting prototype technologies into a design might sound ridiculous, it's the only way the US Navy can ensure it keeps a technological edge on a design currently expected to last until the mid-2080s at a minimum. As it stands, the first Columbia-class submarine is currently under construction and it's expected to have its voyage in 2031. The USS District of Columbia, which began being built on June 4th, 2022, and according to a highly detailed artist rendering, will look like this. Because we still have eight years before the deployment of this craft, it's likely to have even greater capabilities than it currently does. One of the most important locations for US submarines to fire missiles from is the Red Sea. And now there's dangerous instability and civil war happening in Sudan, threatening this strategic interest. If you're interested in learning more about how the civil war in Sudan is having a ripple effect throughout the world, you can check it out right here. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Thank you for watching.